Okay. Right, so welcome back. Uh, we've, uh, the last one hour, we've uh, actually spoken about um, uh, adultery. We've looked at what scripture has given us as warnings about what the consequences of adultery, certain words of caution that we need to take uh, into consideration. We looked also of certain often how people fall into this uh, uh, to into a state of adultery. In the next um, uh, hour, what we are going to be looking at is um, what do we do? How do we help somebody who's fallen into this place of adultery, this place of an immoral relationship or into unfaithfulness? How do we help someone out from that? Um, so I think let's look at it in two counts. In one um, is, of course, for us personally, if there have been uh, any of us maybe here or anyone listening who's in a struggle or in this sin, uh, ways of knowing that there is hope and there is a way to come restored and whole <clears throat> out of this. And the second part of, and also for those of us who may be ministering to people who may fall into sin and fall into adultery, uh, a way to help them and uh, give them hope as to, how they can move from a, a place of sin into a place of wholeness. The second part is what we are also going to be looking at how, what are some practical boundaries or um, uh, certain certain moral um, uh, aspects of how we need to take care of, what, what do we need to take care of, practical measures on how we can place those boundaries where we can fence ourselves from such, uh, from uh, from getting into such such a struggle. Uh, is there any question? If not, I'm going to move forward. So just the first five minutes of questions on anything that uh, we addressed earlier. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Okay. So um, I, I guess not. So then we'll we'll keep going forward. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having a bad throat. <clears throat> All right. We so the this part of the uh, lesson. What we're going to look into is what if people, a husband or a wife has gone into sexual sin, what is something, what is it that we do and uh, how do we help them to work through this? And often people who are engaged in this kind of an emotional relationship or an immoral relationship find it extremely hard to step out, to, to find hope through this. It's almost like they're in a deep pit and there isn't a, a way outside. But uh, we know through scripture, we know with the God that we serve, that there is hope. There is just through, uh, through who Christ is and the freedom that he gives, there is hope. So the first and important thing to understand is um, to know that no matter where we are or how much we have fallen, there's nothing that is hard for the Lord for to bring back, to restore, to redeem. And we see that as a principle so much in scripture, right? So no matter how, let's, let's look at David himself. We see that at the best of his times, he fell back. You know, uh, uh, he, he went back very many steps because of his adulterous relationship and the murder that ensued after that. But we see that there's nothing that is not there for God to restore and to bring back. And, and no matter what, we know that if we are in a place of true confession and repentance, turning to God, looking at him for help, he is able to take us off from there. And we see that uh, scripture says it, you know, when I called to you, you have answered me. When I've been troubled deep in my affliction, you have saved me. You have rescued me 
out of the miry clay. And that helps us see that with God's help, we can come around, we can recover, we can come back strong to, to the purposes and to things that God has for us. Now, as we begin to understand that, something that we also need to <clears throat> um, internalize is to understand the Father's love. And the Father's love has been beautifully demonstrated in the story of the prodigal son. You know, we see how uh, once the prodigal son left home, you know, took away the money, it took away all his share, uh, broke it all, you know, spent it all, finally came to the deepest part of his life where he had nothing. And he decides and he realizes that he can actually return back to his father. He can actually return back to his father who had enough and plenty. So when, you know, he probably thought, uh, and, and that's what he says, right? I, I'll at least, I can at least, uh, you know, be treated as a servant in my father's house. So when he was in his mind, he was prepared that it, it would probably not be a very good reception. It would be something that may be humiliating, a sense of an embarrassment. But on the converse, we see how, the father welcomed him with arms open wide, so much so that he puts the best robe and he puts a ring and he creates a party. And that's the love of the father that we see. And that uh, what, what Jesus is doing by expressing that, he paints the love and shows us, you know, just a bit of, I mean, we, we, we're able to see only a glimpse of it, of the love God has for us that the Father's love, the Heavenly Father's love is much stronger, it's greater, it's more intense than a human father's love. And Romans tells us that, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. So we can be assured that when we return to the Father, He is there with arms open, with the best things to give us if we come back in repentance. We also do know that it is only God who is the restorer of our souls. He is the only one who is the overseer and the restorer of our souls. We see that in Psalms 23.3. It says he is the restorer of our souls. So he is the one who can reshape and change our souls and make it whole once again. So even if we have gone astray, but when we have returned to him, he is the restorer because he is the one who oversees our soul. So having assurance that when we return to him, he will do what he is best at, which is to restore us and make us whole. Now, through what we do, we also see that the power of the Holy Spirit is what turns things around for us in our lives. We see that in Isaiah uh, 61, 3, where it says, you know, uh, um, the, the, the Holy Spirit is there to console those who mourn, to give those, uh, to give beauty for ashes, to give oil for joy, oil of joy for mourning, to give a garment of pray, praise for those with the spirit of heaviness. You know, there will be, there will be gladness. There will, mourning is off and dancing comes. The sackcloth is off and they will be clothed with, with gladness again in Psalms 30. So we see that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us out from the ashes to something that is beautiful. So it is his, it's not our doing. It's not our, only our work, but it is his internal um, churning or refining that takes place as we repent and as we are willing to submit to him. Now, those who have those uh, people, you know, who fall into adultery, um, feel that it's it's uh, it it is a way forward that is too intense, that is too severe. And uh, you know, when you hear people who fallen into adultery speaking, their desire to be able to come out of it. I mean, I've heard people saying, and I wish I could wake up in the morning and pretend as if none of this had happened. 
right the pain that they go through not just in the rejection in the in the problems and the consequences of the uh, as a result of their adulterous relationship but also of the fact that they feel so trapped like like being in a prison to be able to get away from the emotions and from the um from the attachments that they've been feeling to the to uh, the third person right but scripture shows us that you know when we keep our eyes on the lord he's the one who picks us out from a trap as uh, psalm 25:15 he's the one who picks us up from the trap uh, from a trap so he's the one who takes us away from captivity so that we can walk in freedom now although it appears as a long long journey or a, or a long place into recovery every step matters it is the initial steps that matter to uh, you know towards towards your destiny so when you're encouraging people to make that step into freedom the first, one of the things that you would help them to see is to know that even though it looks long even though it looks difficult taking one step at a time towards choosing your freedom now as you begin this journey there are certain things that is important for the person who has offended the offended person needs to do one the first thing is to recognize that sin is sin the journey begins when you call sin sin you have to come to a place of not justifying the action or excusing the sin saying that it is it's only because you know my my spouse didn't do this or didn't do that or it's only because of uh, or it isn't i mean it it is not sin it's it's just a, a good friend my colleague is a good friend uh, the fact is you need to call a spade a spade you need to know that often satan puts you through a deceptive uh, loop that makes you justify that your actions aren't wrong and these are deceptions these are lies that that come about uh, shri kumar i'll just take your question i'm just i'll just complete this bit and sure. i take it thank question. you thank you pastor thank you yeah so um uh, so the first thing that that we need to do and it, if it is a personal journey to identify that any Uh, intimacy outside <clears throat> of the marriage is to be called sin and we call it out as sin for those who we may be ministering to you may find a lot of people hiding behind these lies and it's something that you may need to call out as a minister or as a pastor and say sometimes it, it may be being a little bit more hard and saying uh, you know you seem to be covering up on some things or there are certain excuses that 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 uh, that uh, you you're falling in we we need to bring out that sin is sin and any sin that that uh, it says all unrighteousness is sin and this is unrighteous anything that keeps away from god's word is sin and we are answerable to god so the first point where the journey begins is is being able to call uh, call out the sin to recognize that it is sin and uh, bring about an agreement yes i am in a sinful place okay yes shri kumar i can take your question now yeah, thank you pastor yeah. pastor um, as you are uh, sorry am i audible yes yes you are thank you thank you pastor pastor my question is um, as we were discussing on the like how the god has restored that relationship of david even though um, when he fallen uh into that sin and uh, not only in adultery but also in murder but i just want to know in this present circumstances there are few cases which i know and uh, sometimes i i was confused i used to be confused that how to like uh, you know uh, how to hand like uh, not personally handle but um, i used to think that uh, how this can be like uh, you know restricted uh, uh where uh, you know um, when some relationships goes um uh very deep and uh, when the woman get pregnant and when she conceive and in such cases uh, and uh, this person is already having a 
having a uh, like a having a married life Family. and um, so in that cases if uh, if one of this person wants to come out from this relationship um then uh, now she is conceived now you cannot say that you can abort a child also and um, you know and uh, how can uh, we guide them um, because of this uh, you know the entire scenario which is now is in a in a very uh, very yes. perfect stage so how can we handle this case thank you pastor thanks a lot yeah yeah absolutely i think shri kumar <clears throat> what you brought out is is a, a reality this becomes extremely messy when um, when there is pregnancy involved when there is conception when there is a birth of a child in the it becomes extremely messy um uh, yes we need to use a lot of wisdom as we deal with concerns like this the first and foremost thing we look at is one um the, um, the, the person uh, let's I, i'm okay I'm, I'm just going to say maybe this is a man who is uh, you know who's been adulterous in this relationship just for as an example for us to make it easier so the man of course needs to come to a place of repentance to be able to cut off the relationship and bring about restoration within his own family now that in itself is a process because with uh, you know when it has moved into uh, a, a a pregnancy coming as a result of it it can get a lot more deeper and and difficult um but the first thing we need to check to see is to ensure that the man comes to a place of uh, repentance and building on uh, himself as well as that relationship uh the, this because it scripture is very clear that the covenant relationship is the foremost important one okay uh we do understand that the other party in this uh has has a lot lot of difficulties has a lot more things um to take care of but uh, we need to ensure or help the person the, the third party to come to a place of living through those consequences um so it it is you know establishing uh, establishing her emotional health finding out ways of maybe finding support for this person so that they can be taken care of yes we we do not agree on uh, on abortions no and i would never recommend this um in fact i think i had a very similar example i had a case uh, like this where um there was you know in an adulterous relationship it was not the man who came to me but it was the woman the 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 third person who came who was pregnant who came to us asking for what what could be done so uh it it the the, the church was very clear that uh, the the man involved had to you know help we were he was helped to severe that relationship and to you know restore things with his wife and have nothing to do to completely severe cut off amputate this relationship so he had nothing to do with this uh, to do with this third party the third party yes we had to find uh, support within family uh, support of maybe extended organizations to protect to help to encourage um, you know she came in in her third month of pregnancy asking for a decision of what she needed to do and uh, you know we she was counseled she was she was helped she was shown scripture but on her own she decided to abort her child right uh, i think within uh, within i think a month after after all you know there were there were these multiple sittings and working through she decided to abort abort the child and uh, then you know did not come back for help at all um it is our responsibility or you know I, I, and i think if it is if it is within a church situation right it's the responsibility to ensure that the man goes back to his family
am I one percent of the past one of Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I think I lost my connection for a, for a minute. Yeah. So um. So so yeah. What I was trying to say was to ensure that the husband gets back to his home, where you work on him uh, and and help restoration happen, and for the woman in question, the third party in question. Um, to get her to for help and support and whatever things she she may need by finding out resources of it. So this is something that that I think as principal uh, is what we would definitely follow. To to that 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 cutting off really does need to happen, even if it may may mean that there are certain consequences that have come as a result, like like maybe a child out of that relationship. The cutting off is important in order to maintain. First family. Yes, Harrison. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Yes, yes, Harrison. Thank you. Okay. Um, just like uh, what uh, my brother shared and what you have also explained, it is something that when I look at it, it's more like you know you leave a scar in the life of the woman. I'm talking about the wife in question. Now it is. It is one thing, you know, for the man or the husband, you know, to come back in and see how, you know, he builds, you know, the home back or maybe restores, you know, back the home to what it used to be. Now, like the one that, you know, pregnancy is involved and the child is not aborted, it's a little bit difficult, it's a little bit sensitive you know for you to like you know deal with you know such situations you know and you know maybe when the child is born the child is born the father is the father the mother is the mother both third party and the real wife you know gets to live with this you know for the rest of their life so my question now is that in cases like this you know because i have a situation where the husband accused the wife of adultery. And she was pregnant, but she stood on her ground, you know, to say that I did not commit any adultery. You are the only man that I know, and this child belongs to you. And the man, you know, was not even paying attention, you know, maybe agreeing to what she was saying. Left the house and leaving her out all by herself. And she nursed that pregnancy by herself until she gave birth. So it was more like, you know, the, the neighbors in the compound, you know, were the one that called him you know, to say, oh, your wife you know, has delivered. And by the time, you know, he came to visit, he saw that the resemblance, you know, of that baby was nothing compared to him. Mm -hmm. As in, the resemblance was just him. So a lot of things were done and they found out that he was the father of that child. Mm. And this has left a scar in the life of that woman that up to date, she's not at peace with him. So mm. how do we help you know, the women in this aspect? You know the women or who the one that is a victim of this situation who is to bear all the consequences not having anything to do with the, the situation being faithful in the relationship and at the end of the day such a thing you know has happened to them how how mm -hmm. do we help them you know stay in such relationship and not mm -hmm. feeling hot mm -hmm. thank you Hi. Thank you, Harrison. <clears throat> so, 
I think what Harrison is bringing about is when someone has been offended without any fault <clears throat> of theirs. There is no fault uh, that can be found in them, but they equally or even more go through a pain. And I think it's um, uh, this could be even in similar situations where there is adultery that's happened, where there is uh, someone who's offended and someone who's been the offender. So whether there has been adultery that's actually taken place or it has been uh, an accusation of one, it definitely causes a deep scar and, um, and, and, and deep wounds. Um, so any spouse who has been betrayed definitely uh, either through you know an allegation or or an actual um, uh, uh, abandonment or adultery definitely goes through a lot of pain and they need support and help through the time uh, we may not be able to speed in the healing process we may not be able to push them into healing fast and I think that sometimes is very inconsiderate of us to demand that maybe because they are Christians they should come easy to a place of acceptance or a place of forgiveness now even as I'm saying that it is important that the offended person needs to forgive there is no two ways about it because that is the very fiber of Christianity that even when we have been outrageously sinful to God the Father he forgave us by sending his son now that's the example we see so no matter how big the sin is how big the hurt is the offended person should come to a place of forgiveness right but it may take time it may be a journey it may be a season it's something that they need to progress into so we are looking finally at the offended being able to release forgiveness by taking maybe the time they need to work through the emotional struggles and the emotional knots that have taken place. It's definitely not easy. Uh, and, I, and I see we've seen people walking through this journey. Some make it well. Some often even choose to just end that relationship, uh, which we know in, in the case of an adultery, it is permitted. That, you know if the, if they are in an adulterous relationship there is they are permitted to uh, for divorce and that's that's one of the uh, places where a divorce is permitted however whatever they choose to do the offended person needs to release that forgiveness even though whatever has happened even though there's been suspicion even though there's been abuse, there's been emotional uh, hurt, there's been abandonment, there's been shame, there's been humiliation. Helping them to work towards having that heart of love and without that offense. Because as a believer, we are all called to love as God loves. And yes, this offended person does need this grace to live this up to a place where they can actually uh, come to a place of healing and wholeness by discussion with a with, uh, counselor. The other thing that I would say is now, in the case that Harrison, you brought up, um, a restoration and a reconciliation between the, this, this party, the offended and the offender, that is important where the offender comes to a place of knowing that he's been come he's been uh, uh, he has wronged his wife 
coming to a place of repentance to her, asking her for forgiveness for the things he's put her through, coming to a place of sharing, maybe uh, of, you know, it, it requires a lot of humility to come to a place to say, hey, I was wrong. And that too, in something as grievous as this, right? It, it comes to a place of humility. But healing, like, like, like you know, like we were, we were talking about healing or hope is always there, knowing that when we can bring about these hurts to God and ask him to restore these wounds and hurts. It's a journey. I, and even as I'm saying it, it looks maybe like a five minute thing, but it's a journey that can often take months and years where both this husband and this wife needs to work together to be able to come to establishing trust once again, to be able to establish that intimacy and closeness once again. And that can happen only through um, open communication, uh, you know, open repentance, confession, building of faith, going through those emotional overwhelmed moments, um, living that together, working with that together. So yes, it's a journey. It, it is hard. It is difficult. Uh, but nonetheless, I, with the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible. Yes, Harrison, I think you had a follow-up question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel like sharing some few things about my life experience. Sure. And it will help, it will help every one of us that is here. Because sometimes, you know, we shy away from it and, you know, we talk, you know, of other people, but us, you know, in question, one way or the other, we must have gone through some of these things. I remember the early stage of my marriage where my wife, you know, had to travel out and, you know, barely stayed, you know, for almost two years apart. And I, I committed adultery. And my, my faith, you know, and my work with God was questioned. And it's very important for us to realize that in as much as we need help, we as the victim or whoever that is involved, you know, needs to realize that he or she has wronged. It is very important for us to understand that we have a very big role to play in the healing. And I'm talking about, you know, whoever that must have committed the adultery. Because in as much as you go to the pastor and the pastor will quote all the Bible passages, tell you everything that he needs to tell you. When the mind is not made up, when the mind of that person is not made up, you know, to, to ask for forgiveness, or to come up, you know, to say that, yes, I have done something that is wrong. Healing will not take place. And why I'm saying this is that when this thing happened, you know, it's more like, you know, my, my reputation was questioned. My work with God was questioned. My faith was questioned. And... It troubled me. And in as much as nobody has seen what I have done, God has seen what I have done. I know what I have done. But I took a bold step. I called my pastor. He was the first person I called. I called my pastor and I said, I want to see you. He was like, Harrison, this one you want to see me. I hope all is well. I said, all is well. And I went to his house. And I sat down and I said, I have something to tell you. And he was curious and he was anxious, you know, to hear what I want to say. And I opened my mouth to tell him that I have sinned before God and I have sinned before man. This is what I have done. He was very shocked. Not shocked that I did it was shocked that I came to tell him because it's quite difficult you know for us you know to come up in and and say what we have done then you know we just go you know we cover up you know what we have done 
And when I told him that, I said, I'm also willing you know, to come before the church and also confess. And he told me that for the fact that I've come to him, there's no need, you know, coming before the church, you know, to, to say it. We prayed. And when I went back home, I called my wife. And I did the same thing. And I told her, this is what I have done. She was broken at first. But for me, in order for my life to be restored and my home, you know, to, to be restored and not giving room for the devil to dominate, I needed to do these things. And when I told her, I gave her some time, you know, to like, you know, reflect on it. But for me, I needed to do the right thing. I needed to confess it first because when you don't confess it, the devil will deal with you with it. You know, it will haunt you. If you're really a Christian and, you're, and you really walk with God, it will haunt you. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we started healing. One good thing you know, that I heard from my wife is that even the step you know, that I've taken marvels her. And today, we are stronger than before. We are more bonded than before. We are more united than before. And God's presence is always with us. So why I'm sharing this is that this topic is very, very important you know, for our Christian race. Because this is one area that we don't want to give room for the devil to operate. Because the truth is that when it happens, if you're not careful, it could destroy a lot of things. It will ruin your marriage. It will ruin your relationship. It will ruin your work with God. And everything about you will be questioned. So I believe, you know, by sharing this, you know, it will broaden our minds, you know, to, to understand, you know, what it really means, you know, to work with God. And what it means, you know, for us, you know, to stay away from sin. Sin, you know, is just something that keeps us in the dark. It makes us hide. And when we start hiding, you know, when we start hiding, what this means is that everything that God has proposed in a man's life will be, will be hanging. Because one is that fear will be there, shame will be there. You will not be confident, you know, to come before the public, you know, to say that this is this and that is that. When your mind, you know, will prick you to say that, do you believe in what you're saying? So, I think, you know, with this little experience of mine, it will help us, you know, to see reasons, you know, why we have, you know, where the, the ones, you know, that are involved in this should be able to, like, play that major role because the truth is that when a man's mind is not made up, you know, to for, you know, to forgive or to ask for forgiveness, that that problem or that situation or that challenge, you know, will be will be so difficult to deal with. So that's just what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harrison. Um, when you shared that, I mean, I think that's a testimony that you've shared. And I think, number one, um, you've taken that courage to share that. It was not easy, but thank you, because I think that bless, blesses us to know that we're a body where we um, help and where we stand by our brothers and sisters who've fallen into sin, who's come out from it. And we've seen, you know, by you just sharing it and by what you did, the courage you took, in confessing it to your pastor and to your wife in itself, uh, you know, gives us a way to know that the Lord's blessing has been uh, over you. And we pray and we, um, we ask the, that the Lord just um, gives you a double portion, you and your wife, a double portion of his grace and his unity together 
as you move move ahead. Thank you for sharing. I, I'm sure it touched so many of us. I can hear so see so many messages here. Thank you, Brother Harrison, for doing that. Thank you. Right. So, uh, you know, just by his example, I think a lot of what I wanted to say um, is 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 something that he said. You know, one of the things that he spoke about is getting rid of the lies behind it. And that's one way that the enemy hooks you in. You know, when you do not recognize sin for what it is and do not call it sin, um, you, you hide behind the lies of the enemy that causes further deception, that, for the, that causes further manipulation. And that's what all that sin and get rid of that, those lies. And to also to ensure that we, we need to be in a place of remorse, into a place of absolute repentance. You know, scripture says that godly sorrow produces repentance. So if we know that restoration is on its way when there is godly sorrow and there is a repentance, and that's exactly what uh, uh, you know, Harrison was, was sharing, that, that coming to a place of recognizing that you have been, you have wronged not, not just man, but you have wronged God, and to come to a place of that godly sorrow. Uh, an important practical thing, you know, especially for those who may continue to be in, in that relationship. Yes, coming to a place of coming in right, in, in, the, in the right place with God is something you need to do alongside what we call an amputation. The only way that you deal with sin, you know, as it talks about in Matthew, it says, if your eye has caused you to sin, gorge it out. If your hand has caused you to sin, cut it off. So it says you need to cut off and deal with that sin. And that could be in any form. And that could even further have consequences. You know, there are times that people who are in extramarital affairs, um, you know, in their workplaces, some way of severing may be to change the job or to move away from that situation or, or you know, resign that place. Yes, there are going to be financial consequences. There are going to be you know, reputation issues, absolutely. But if, if that is followed, if this cutting off happens, like Harrison so rightly said, the enemy doesn't have a foothold. When, when one continues to be in a place of sin, continues to dabble with it, you know, play a little with it, you know, just, a, just a call, just a message, just a peek, just a hello. That itself brings, brings you back into that depth of sin. So it does require recognition that, you know, you need to make the choice. The person who has offended is someone who needs to make the choice of getting this back right. So breaking free from uh, an affair or a relationship or an entanglement definitely requires that that cutting off, that severing off, and it has to be done severely. You know, it it cannot be done gradually. It's not something that you know you can do over the next few months. It it is painful. It's something that has to be done like like then and 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 now, you know, and being able to reverse those those choices that. It, like I said, you know, if it was interactions, if it has been communications, if it has been the, the job or if it has been a place of work or, you know, wherever it is to be able to reverse those choices, change those choices. Because Satan definitely, once he has a hold, you know, like I said, in Ephesians 4.27, it says, don't give the devil a foothold. The minute there is a little bit that is that is given out, you know, that's when he has the, the, the whole of you, okay? I want to uh, quickly deal with, um, with certain boundaries. We did talk about reconciliation, you know, as, uh, as Harrison put forth that question, we were speaking of how reconciliation and healing is important. Yes, the offended as well as the offender um, needs, the offended needs to be, come to a place of repentance, needs to come to a place of calling sin a sin, come to a place of working things out, giving their 
spouse the time they may need to to recover, to to come to a place of uh, uh, reconciliation, um, and be willing to accept whatever the consequence that may come as a result of that act. Whereas the offended, um, they need to be in a place where uh, uh, you know they have the grace to to forgive, to come to a place of releasing that forgiveness and working on that. So these. These steps aren't easy. Sometimes they are uh, a lot more painful just working together and discussing this. I mean, I've seen how often things take a lot of time. But ensuring that, you know, if both the offender and the offended are in places, are in right, right standing with God, we can see that it turns out beautiful. Like Harrison said, it turns out beautiful. The crisis tends to make you much stronger, much more faithful to each other. You walk one, one, in, uh, one in one hand together. And God reflects that healing and reconciliation. Okay, so even if a couple has encountered this, uh, you know, there are times that they may go their separate ways. And uh, it is important that we continue to be loving and support and encourage both of them and help them to live and pursue whatever purposes God has for their lives. Maybe some things may not be come back to its original, may not come back to what it was, but God is still able to help and restore and redeem broken people to the best and the highest in them. Okay, uh, I just want to spend the next five quick minutes um, just to just to go through certain moral boundaries that that uh, you know uh, a couple. How do you safeguard your marriage? And this I think is helpful not just for us, those of us who are in ministry, but you know anyone who who are believers or those who aren't to really ensure how you keep your boundaries strong. How do you discipline your way um, in order to safeguard? your marriage. So if, if you look at page 152 to um, 153, there are a lot of, um, you know, tips, practical tips that are given, and I'm just going to read through each of them. And, uh, you know, quick, quick one liners on each of them. So the first it says, is to be able to maintain your fulfillment within your own marriage, maintaining not just your sexual fulfillment, even your emotional fulfillment in marriage. And one of the ways to, to ensure that is there is to keep your marriage exciting, to do good things, to do fun things, to uh, have uh, fun around each other, to work things together. And if at any point of time you see this as a concern, you know, take it as a measure on what you need to work at. If you aren't satisfied or fulfilled in this area of your marriage, do something. Door into um, uh, in, into into a temptation. Okay. Uh, the next thing is don't do something you would not like your spouse to be doing. Right. If it is maybe you know texting uh, uh, an old friend, um, maybe in the middle of the night, and if you wouldn't want your husband to be doing or your wife to be doing that don't do it yourself, you know, uh, ensure that you keep the same standards that you're keeping for your, for your spouse as well. The third is avoid being away from your spouse for extended periods of time. You know, we, we think, uh, yeah, there, there may be times you're traveling frequently, but I think it's always helpful to not be too long away from each other and to be to stay connected with your with your spouse at all times um, if you are working to ensure that you do not pair up with uh with with a colleague of an opposite sex for 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 trips or for solo um, uh, business trips you know avoid it uh, or uh, you know say that it, it is beyond it's not in your principles you know, keeping some of these boundaries will be absolutely useful and helpful for you in the long run. It may sound kinky to many people, but when you do it, uh, you know, it, it not only establishes an example to others, but it keeps you, it refrains from you getting into any form of a temptation. Okay? Refrain from going out alone, taking drives with those of the opposite sex other than your spouse, you know, drops, um, short drops to the bus stop or taking someone from the office to the work home, uh, from, uh, from home, all of that, the best it, it can be avoided. Be careful about your chatting, your use of social media. Um, 
what are the messages that you send the emails that you send are your passwords all um, you know uh, out for scrutiny scrutiny out for, for for others to see that's important to not doing things in you know on the sly i would say cut off any kind of communication from uh, unnecessary communication from people apart from work times that is needed or to the point you know maybe you may need to communicate to some your team about something but to the point keep it short and that's be careful about be judicious about your interactions next is to be able to guard your mind your thoughts your imagination your feelings and affections um, remember that um, you know sometimes you may have thoughts towards somebody aroused towards someone of the opposite sex it's important to deal with it then and there not allow it to brew and not allow it to simmer and boil but to deal with it then and there taking it to god in prayer being able to come to a place of casting it out and consecrating it asking the lord for his spirit to cleanse your mind to be able to um, see the individual differently you know to guard your mind to not to engage in 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 those thought the uh, thoughts and those affections the next is to be able to maintain your internal boundaries it is to um being careful not to think of anybody else about your spouse now this is something nobody can see this is all within the four i mean the round in in your skull right but what you're doing is making a commitment to the lord that you will will stay in those boundaries and and not allow these thoughts to creep in because everything starts with the thought everything starts with things on the mind okay next is being able to speak positively about your spouse in your conversation with others um avoid personal compliments or any you know flirtations with others not really making a mention about how they're looking or what you know what suits them avoid avoiding those being careful in your interactions with the person that you may have had feelings to um sometimes yes these these feelings do come come up but it makes absolute sense and i've seen a lot of people thinking that if i go confess that i am feeling like this with that person it may go away i think that's the biggest mistake one can make to not express your feelings or give any indications that you feel that way towards somebody okay it uh, you're stepping into something that that's that's causing uh, that's closing in those boundaries so don't be mistaken you don't need to express those those thoughts to anybody uh yeah next would be to yes yeah, staying away from pornography or anything that causes a uh, uh, sin in this area of sexuality uh, pornography in itself engaging in pornography can keep your mind um waiting to lurk on some on on the next temptation so keeping away from pornography avoiding counseling those of the opposite sex avoiding the uh, uh discussing personal problems or anything that may be emotional with someone um of the opposite sex this 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 is the beginning of that intimacy choose to discuss it with your spouse if 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 that isn't possible find someone who can help you with uh, you know maybe someone of uh, no someone of the same sex who can help to restore this emotional lack of emotional intimacy that you're you're finding okay being intentional about past relationships and cutting off those past relationships uh, establishing any other boundaries that may be specifically relevant to your situation i think it's important to evaluate yourself and see where it it takes courage to really look at to have a good look at what you are doing and how you interact you know it could be something in the thoughts it could be something in your words it could be something of your feelings your emotions but ensuring that you uh, uh, really evaluate and establish those boundaries that may be very clear about um uh, about where your stand should be and of course if you are single also to ensure that you establish these boundaries so that you will be fit and ready once you are married all right um yes i'm i'm uh, through with this lesson i know we've we've had a lot to discuss in this this chapter we've had excellent um 
you know, sharings. Uh, any question, we just have, you know, I'm way up time, but just two minutes for anyone for any questions. If not, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Ask the Lord for a protection of our marriages and our singles who may be here. Anybody? Any question? Okay, let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this institution of marriage. Thank you for the way that you have designed it to be for one man, for one woman, to find all our fulfillment within this. Lord, I commit every marriage represented here on this call and everyone, Lord, who's hearing and listening to this. Father, we need your grace, your mercy, your protection over our marriages. Lord, just as we ask you, Father, we pray that we will step in and guard our minds, our thoughts, our feelings. Lord, we will guard our, our very desires and our appetites, Father, that we will seek to receive fulfillment from our own homes, seek to fulfillment from our own partners, Father. Lord, we come against every attack of the enemy in the area of our marriages, Lord, especially when it comes to our sexuality, Father, we pray that you protect us, Lord, even as we establish these boundaries. Give us the courage to call sin a sin. Give us the courage to cut off everything, Lord, that is against your word, that is unrighteous in your sight, Father. Give us, Lord, the courage, Lord, to, uh, to be willing, Lord, to step into your grace, Father. Lord, we pray, God, for those of us who have fallen off the mark, Lord, we repent. Lord, we come with you, Lord, with sorrow and repentance and ask God that you, um, you revive us and you restore us, Lord. If it takes any of us the courage to go back to our spouses and share with them, no matter what the consequences may be, Father, may we, Lord, start that process, that journey of healing, Lord. Lord, you have convicted us, Lord, of our sin. And when we come to you, Lord, in our sin, when we come to you, Lord, there is surely a blessing. Father, I pray, Lord, for for those who've been offended in this call, Father, those who've been offended, Lord, Lord, your grace, your mercy, your love be poured out, Father, so that the scars and the wounds that they feel, Lord, will be healed in Jesus' name, that they will begin to see hope, that there is a living hope in you, Father, that only you, God, can restore and reconcile us, Lord, back to our original places, Father. Lord, I pray for the singles on this call, even as they've heard, Father, I pray that they would establish in their hearts that they would follow you with all their mind, their soul and their spirits, Lord, so that they could be strong examples, strong witnesses to show forth your glory. Thank you, Lord, that you make these difficult topics, Father, um, something that, that, that brings about a teaching for us, yet, Lord, that we need to protect ourselves through this. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We love you. We praise you. I, I bring each one of us hearing this prayer, Lord. I pray that your miracle working power, Lord, goes with them through this week. May they see your miracles in every area of their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank Amen. you. Bless Thank you, you, Pastor. So much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Admi. God bless.